it's a great pleasure to be here to, again, kick off day two. Um, hope everyone was hearing drumming in their sleep last night like I was. Um, but it's a real pleasure and a privilege to introduce uh, this morning's keynote speaker, Mr. Banaj Gautam. Uh, he's the founder and the executive director of the Jane Goodall Institute in Nepal. Um, he's got a long timeline of internationally recognized accomplishments, but what's very exciting for us all to hear is his experience as a practitioner working with communities in Nepal. So please join me in welcoming Minaj to the floor. Thank you very much, Emily. Let me start the stopwatch. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is a huge privilege for me to be standing here and talking to you this morning. Um, considering that I'm not an expert on um, human behavior change, or an expert on anything really. Um, but um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some lessons that uh, we've learned with our work uh, down at the ground uh, back in Nepal. And I'm going to talk about some, it might look a little random, um, because uh, we've worked in you know, different kinds of projects back there. Small scale, um, but um, enough to teach us some, um, some lessons. Um, basically, I work uh, in the field of conservation. It's lately that I got, um, I would like to say, a little bit dragged in the initial phase into animal welfare, but I've grown into it. And, um, and the lessons um, that we've learned uh, with our projects in Nepal um, and the approaches that we've taken, I think there are some components that are very much uh, common to the concept of human behavior change um, especially, and I'm, I wouldn't be very sure, um, and I would leave, leave it up to you, um, people who, who are more accustomed to the idea, concept, and theory of uh, human behavior change, uh, as compared to me, because it was fairly recently and I, I was, uh, that I was introduced to the concept of uh, human behavior change, thanks to Suzanne again. Um, yeah, so I hope you, you, you find some of them um, useful. So basically, uh, lessons learned learned um, in the communities. Uh, basically, I want to focus on understanding humans. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is something that we did um, in my starting phase, early 2004, 2003, when we started working um, against uh, the practice of snake charming. Snake charming is something where uh, certain groups um, from marginalized communities go and catch uh, snakes from the wild and um, keep them in horrible conditions, of course, um, display them um, as a source of uh, livelihood um, for themselves. And we, would, um, would, we started confiscating uh, these snakes because we had a um, legal framework that, uh, that allowed us to you know, intervene uh, in, the, in the setting. There's a little video that I... In Chitwan City, we met up with Alex. He used to be a snake charmer. Years earlier, Manoj tried to confiscate his cobra. <laughs> Alex's gang of thugs threatened to beat him up, but Manoj was patient. He listened and honored him as an artist trying to make a living, respecting the animals in his own way. Eventually, Alex turned over the snakes. Now they've become good friends. <laughs> Because of his shady past, he knows smugglers and informs Manoj if they're planning to transport or sell animals illegally. We're being honest to them because we don't want to see them in trouble, you know, like these are not like big mafia people or you know, anything like that. They're just like a marginalized group of people, you know. It's pretty wild. So we're going to release a baby python. 
here in, in our jungle, you know, which is relatively much safer. Look at how much they put it away. Any main grab, any mere concern, Pani, you know, for again. Yeah, Mati. I love doing this kind of things, you know, because you, you always uh, leave a print, leave a print on, you know, on the people you, you involve. As you go. Freedom. Right. So, the human, the human side of um, our work, conservation or animal welfare, mostly the issues that we're constantly trying to tackle, has a lot to do with humans. Um, undesired behaviors, inappropriate behaviors from, uh, from humans. So it is a huge component of uh, what we do and mostly it is the key. Talking about Alex, this guy that you just um, heard about, um, the first time we tried to confiscate his uh, snakes, he was a street magician, um, we went. I had to wait until he was done with that round of performance, which went for three hours. We didn't intervene in the middle. We waited, and when we first, after he was done with his show, when we first approached him and told him why we were there, uh, he and his group people, they flipped. And we almost got beaten up because he had like almost 40 henchmen uh, who had got surrounded. Uh, and we would have got uh, you know, beaten up, despite of the fact that we had police uh, force behind us. But we didn't use it because that would have been uh, a great opportunity missed. Instead, what we did was um, basically, you know, try to understand uh, his position, why he was uh, using the snakes. Um, the, the key was in recognizing um, this man as a charmer, not just a snake charmer, but as a charmer, a people charmer as well, because what he did uh, demanded him to keep uh, a crowd of about 300 to 500 people in tight grip for three hours and make them pay voluntarily. Which, is a, which requires a great skill as an artist. So what I told him was I, I respect what he does, I respect his job, and uh, I respect him as, a, as an artist. And, um, and the second thing that we established was that I d do understand that he was a snake lover in his own ways. So if you, you know, that really worked because if, if you make that kind of positive uh, approach, then they can't say no because you're giving them you know, a positive reward by, by admitting that they're good in something. So what we focused on is why do you have to use the snakes to gather the crowd? The snakes have didn't, uh, didn't have any role in, uh, in the whole show. They were basically you know, tools to gather the crowd. So we encouraged him. We, we talked about how he has to trust in his own abilities because we've seen how good he is uh, at what he does. He could be a little more creative and try and come up with other ideas to, to gather the crowd, which he did later. And, um, and the result was the snakes were already hidden. There was nothing we could have done to get them back if it wasn't for Alex who decided uh, that he wanted to give the snakes back. And from then onwards, he never used the snakes and he started giving us information. Uh, there, I, I don't even have any counts on how many other animals we, have, uh, we were able to rescue and confiscate, uh, including dancing bears, owls that, that were said to be smuggled out of the country, all based on uh, information that we got from, from Alex. So basically, uh, the lesson is fo always focus on creating similarities between uh, you and them, if, if that's how it is, and, uh, and focus on the closeness, increasing the closeness, not uh, creating the drift um, uh, between, between you guys. The only difference they will understand later is that particular thing that you feel is wrong. Rest is all good. Rest, this is, some, this is literally what I told him, that other than this part, I respect you, I respect your job, and you have to do the same. You know, I, I, I want you to reciprocate you by respecting my job, because my job is to rescue the snakes. And he, he got it, you know, we could be friends, we could be sitting together drinking somewhere, yeah. So that kind of approach really did work uh, in, in this case. Elephants. Since we cannot get permission to film, we sneak in at night and capture what we can. Actually, we just did a little bit of you know, undercover work, um, trying to take some pictures. <laughs> You know, it was really disheartening and you know, heartbreaking to see how they were repeatedly hitting the, the tip of the of the trunk, you know, which is the most sensitive part of the of the of, of the elephant. So what you just saw, the video wasn't that great, but um, 
basically this is a, a little clip on how they train, break down the baby elephants, turn them into working elephants. Um, again, the human side of things. Um, Mahout, um, so when we, when we first did that, uh, that video, that undercover thing, we, I did it for uh, PETA UK basically, and it was out in the, in the internet and uh, there was huge public outrage that uh, sort of uh, vilified us, um, created that, um, um, you know, that drift, the difference between the, between the industry people and also the authorities um, there. Then I, I realized that uh, we needed to do something to, to, to you know, bridge the gap. So we came up with this idea of this uh, workshop with, uh, with, the, with the Mahouts, who are basically the, the frontline caretakers of the elephants. Everything, the elephant welfare, everything of the elephant welfare depends on them because they are there 24 hours. So whether they take care of the elephants or not, everything depends on them. They are the ones who know their issues best. Um, so, you know, you can read the, the responses from, from them because before uh, we did this workshop, there were a couple of other interventions done by other organizations, but uh, it was more about, uh, you know, telling them what to do rather than, you know, listening from, um, from them. So this approach um, not only helped us um, bridge that gap between the Mahouts, but also this, this just transcends beyond the, the, the level of Mahouts to the in industry operators as well. And um, because we, we treated them as the experts of their issues and also the elephant issues, um, now um, the relationship that we have uh, been able to force between the uh, operators, the, the whole tourism industry operators, um, has led us to this uh, great opportunity. I mean, we, we're not sure how this might actually end up, but this October 2nd, we're having a, a, a workshop. Some experts are coming from abroad as well, uh, where we'll be discussing about how we can take the whole industry into a sanctuary model, keeping in mind that the, the, the interest of the industry people will, uh, will remain intact because we know that it is, it is not their motivation, the industry people's motivation to actually torture the elephants. Nobody wants to be the bad guy. Uh, it's just they want, they have invested in these elephants heavily, there's no insurance or anything like that. Um, so they want their return, they want the profit, but uh, that doesn't necessarily have to involve uh, any kind of suffering or torturing of, uh, of the elephants. And, and they're very, very positive about it. We've had amazingly, amazingly positive response from them and they're very much looking forward to it. Now they, they, they call us if they, if they hit any uh, you know, uh, problems or issues, they give us a call. So that allows us to, to get involved in the, in the, in the situation, which is, uh, again, in a very positive uh, way of um, approaching the community. Dolphins. This is a chemical, it's a pesticide. People might have used this one for fishing. It, it literally kills the whole, you know, ecology of the, of the river. So that could have happened and this is the river, you know, I'm repeatedly saying this is the river that passes through the national park. This is dangerous, this is something little. All right, so dolphins. Um, <coughs> these are the Gansitic River dolphins, uh, less than 2,000 uh, remaining in the wild. Uh, I don't know of any captive population of these species. Seriously threatened, uh, especially in the Nepalese waters. Um, they only seasonally migrate, and there are very few, I mean, less than 10 individuals that uh, stay there throughout the year. Threatened by poison fishing, the trend of poison fishing that I already talked about in the video. Uh, mining, rock excavation from the riverbed during low water season. Um, dam construction, uh, literally fragmenting the population, overfishing. Um, they sometimes get trapped in fish nets and drown. So that's the issue. The humans, who are the humans here? Again, um, local fishermen, subsistence fishing, basically. Uh, they can't survive for long without, uh, without fishing. A day's catch is hardly enough uh, you know, to meet their needs of the day or two, maybe, maximum. Um, so <clears throat> we came up with this idea of responsible fishing cooperative. The idea is that we put in some seed money, uh, which will also actually help us unite uh, the, the, the fishermen that, uh, who did things differently in their own ways. Now by uh, you know, having this cooperative, we, we, we had a mass um, of, of, of fishermen. 
So the idea was we would uh, encourage them to try alternative ways of income generation so the, the, the pressure in the, in the fish stock in the rivers would be a little low. Um, some people, um, some people gave some flack with, you know, about this concept because they think we are, we are actually sanctioning or promoting the idea of fishing. The fishing is fine given that there's huge uh, competition for the, for the um, dolphins there. But sometimes it's really, really uh, important to take a, a step backward to create that opportunity for you to be able to take a leap in the near future. Um, the, the reason I'm saying this is basically, I'll give you one example. In 1991, I was six years old. The first symposium on river dolphin conservation happened in, in Pakistan, and it was then where, they, where the scientists, the, the leading experts, established the, the common most uh, threats, the most eminent threats, overfishing and, uh, and the use of chemical pesticides in the rivers. And it took me to be 28 years old to take a lead and got, uh, to, to get those two eminent threats, chemical uh, pesticide, particularly one pesticide called endosulfan, which is a highly toxic organochlorine uh, chemical, uh, and the commercial fishing there. It took me, 20, uh, you know, uh, I was 28 years old when um, we got it banned. Uh, in um, 2013 or so. So things take time anyways. Things take time and nothing happens, despite of the fact that we know what it is that's causing all these troubles and uh, you know, compromising survival, um, and creating you know, survival issues. Um, so it's always wise to make, you know, take some time knowing that there will be, you're, knowing that you're taking that time to create opportunity, better opportunity for the future. Um, so when you, when you take some time and give that chance for them or give them, give them a little bit of freedom, um, take that pressure off from them, then they will be more receptive uh, towards the ideas that you're trying to uh, share or, you know, uh, roll at, uh, you know, on their side. So this is something that worked and, um, and now these, uh, these people are, uh, are positive. We could have easily imposed a ban. Actually, they were very reluctant, hesitant in taking the seed money. They didn't want it because they thought we were there to, uh, to ban the fishing at all. I mean. Uh, completely ban the, 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 the fishing, prohibit them from uh, you know, going into the waters with the intention of fishing. Um, so basically that would have leave, left a vacuum in the system. And, and we all know what happens when, when there's that kind of vacuum. They would have uh, uh, you know, gone illegal fishing or something like that. It, it always gets you know, filled. So how can we uh, resolve it without you know, creating that kind of crisis for anyone? Also, this is a livelihood issue for them. That, that's something that we have to um, understand. So basically, we, and there, there, are, there are so many other, way, other things that we could have immediately uh, imposed or proposed or something like that, like uh, maybe creating a regulation in cat size and you know, those kind of things. Uh, we are not doing that because we want them to come up with that. That will give us some time to actually uh, you know, condition them in certain ways or make, you know, slowly create that opportunity for them to be uh, you know, convinced, self-convinced. Uh, that this is the right way to maintain that sustainability without causing any uh, any uh, problems for other species uh, that depend on the on the fish stock as well. So now what's happening is these fishermen, on a daily basis, before they sell their catch, they bring to, uh, the you know the, the, the cats to our station where we get to uh, do all the measurements, record keeping on the species, how many did they catch, in, you know, involving for how many hours in fishing, how many uh, number of fishermen were in one team from which segment of the river and everything. So now we almost have a, a whole year of daily data of loads of fish, different species. So uh, our intention is to be able to create a trend, whether you know, any species is declining or increasing. That, that will work as an indicator of the, you know, of, about how the river is doing. This is the, uh, something that uh, happened, is, is happening for the first time in our country, uh, which is again you know, involving these people. Uh, basically, so that will also allow us to later, you know, make them realize that uh, dolphins, being the key species, uh, can also create other opportunities uh, for their livelihoods, um, which will again help us get uh, a larger participation from the communities. So this is basically a win-win for everyone. Vultures. <laughs> Population declination of vultures is termed to be the highest rate of population declination of any bird species ever.
But when I heard that, you know, they're, they're dying, I couldn't even, like stop myself from, you know, doing something. Diclofenac is a common anti-inflammatory medication that's given to cattle. It's also highly poisonous to vultures. A few years earlier, Manoj helped the villagers set up a refuge for vultures. Dead cattle are now tested for diclofenac. If positive, they are buried. If negative, they're skinned and left in the field for the vultures. So we came up with the idea of, you know, this uh, vulture restaurant uh, where vultures can, you know, get safe food and stay away from like, uh, like poison food. So, vultures, um, as many as 400 vultures um, were dying after they fed one carcass, the only food source, and that's poisoned. They died in huge numbers within 10 years. Um, Nine, some species saw uh, as uh, much as 98% declination in the entire subcontinent, not only in Nepal, India, Pakistan, uh, and Bangladesh included. Um, in, the, the, in this particular village, Basa Basai, um, well, and, and throughout, the, throughout the entire length of, uh, of the country, vultures are uh, you know, thought to be unhygienic, uh, bad omen, um, something that eats cows and dead cows. I mean, you know, uh, eating cow is a taboo in, in, according to Hinduism. So it wasn't very easy for us to uh, <clears throat> get them interested in vulture conservation, uh, something that they never liked anyways. Um, but in fact, the fact is opposite. Uh, the vultures uh, are the hygiene workers in the environment, very, very efficient cleaners of the environment. Um, when uh, we saw the, the, the serious declination in vulture population, we started having problems, so many different kinds of problems, multifolds in, in, in different sectors, including public health, uh, because uh, the, uh, the carcass were just rotting for weeks, uh, creating opportunities for jackals and, and uh, stray dogs and everything to mingle together, causing uh, outbreak, rabies, serious out, rabies outbreaks. Uh, India, I think, has some, uh, some good uh, science work done on that, uh, you know, facts and figures about it. Uh, rats, bubonic plague, um, you know, outbreak and in serious in insect infestation uh, causing the chances of anthrax outbreak as well. Uh, but if it was for the vultures, vultures could clean up a whole uh, 600 pounds cattle in 20 minutes. They will scratch the bones even. That's how efficient they, uh, they are. So it, it took us some time um, to, you know, get the people interested. We came up with this idea of vulture restaurant. This is not a restaurant where you eat vultures like seafood restaurant or something like that. This is a, a restaurant for the vultures, by the way. Um, so basically what we did was, if an animal dies, it's a situation, you know, people cannot leave the, the, the dead carcass rotting in, 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 the, in the cow sheds. So they already needed to, uh, there was a need to dispose them off somewhere. So that needed some labor and this and that. And what we did was uh, we gave the opportunity to the local people to call us. So we'd go uh, find out. We didn't have any means of chemical analysis to find out whether diclofenac was introduced in the system uh, or not. So we used interrogation. We used uh, you know, uh, medical records if they were uh, introduced with any drugs uh, whatsoever, uh, especially uh, diclofenac. If uh, Gabriel already talks about if positive, then you know, uh, we'd bury them. Um, so, <clears throat> basically, what we did was we just tweaked the existing practice, the existing need of uh, disposing the, the, the carcass into making it slightly safer by bringing in a tiny bit of a uh, system and also we made it easier for them. So they would want to give us some money anyway. And uh, when, we, when we would bring that carcass uh, to this uh, safe area, which we called Vulture Restaurant, uh, we had a, a, a hide dealing person 
would come and skin the, skin the animal, making it easier for the vultures to come and feed uh, before the animal rots. So that would fetch us $6 per hide. Three, three, $3 that person would take, he would give us $3. So that $3 we would use to uh, get another carcass for next time. So it was self-sustainable. We didn't invest, I, I, I don't remember investing more than $500 so far. And this was early 2005 when we first you know, came up with the concept. And now this is replicated throughout the subcontinent in India, Pakistan, and, and, and Bangladesh as well. And there are as many as 17 vulture restaurants in Nepal uh, created by other organizations that was, uh, you know, they, they, they replicated it. Um, and we, had, we, we saw some really, really good uh, results in, in certain pocket areas where this concept was, uh, was used. So how did we involve the humans? in this, um, basically something that was a taboo to touch the vultures, um, you would go one, one level below uh, in, in the caste hierarchy if you touch the vultures, that's how bad it was. Um, pride factor, another uh, important human behavior change tool, I think. Uh, if people take, start taking pride uh, in something, then there, will, you know, th then there will be a value. If uh, people value something, then they will protect it. Basically, so this is a picture of Vulture um, <coughs> Conservation Awareness Festival that we did in 2010. Uh, more than 15,000 people participated. There were two ministers uh, who uh, came and boosted the morale of the, of the, of the villagers. Uh, you can see more than 400 uh, men and women from the village were uh, self-mobilized. Um, so everything about the, uh, about the festival was about the vultures. So that, that is ongoing energy. That's how we feed the energy in the, in the system because I don't know how much it applies to the, to the uh, theory or the concept of human behavior change, but this is, this is very much uh, a positive reinforcement of creating uh, or, or letting that habit mature like um, uh, Joe was talking about yesterday. Um, it's very important. If you don't want to see the relapse, then let that habit mature to certain, you know, let that habit formation cycle complete. And uh, these, these are the kinds of tools um, that we use. And pride factor, uh, something that they want to be able to tell other people with, with pride and, uh, and dignity, something positive that they've done. Once they have introduced themselves as the advocates in front of other masses, other people, then the chances of relapse is, is very low because they have established themselves and it's in their psyche. Uh, I think that's how the community psychology works um, as well. And now the village that had never seen anything like that, that kind of festival before, the village that didn't have any other kind of identity, now is known as the Vulture Village, uh, which is something that uh, the local villagers take pride in. Garimai Festival. It is the morning of Nepal's largest animal sacrifice festival. Known as the mother of all sacrifices, Garimai Jatra is held in Bara district in the south of Nepal. Millions of people will visit this festival over the coming days. More than half of them devotees from India, which is just across the border and where sacrifice has been banned in many states. The night before, on the eve of the Garamai festival, animal welfare and religious groups held a vigil and protest in a nearby town. At the end of a campaign which has lasted for months, campaigners were desperately hoping to persuade the chief priest of the Garamai festival and its organizers to find an alternative way to celebrate and worship Garamai. There is no law or regulation relating to sacrificial rituals, nor the welfare of the animals involved. The government supports sacrifice with subsidies and grants, and Gadamai Festival organizers this year received the equivalent of over six. I'm not 
रोगर हो महामारी का रूप में आँच विभिन्न किसिम का रोग अब जस्त कहीं हुरी बतास जस्ता अब विनाशकारी आरिया में अब भन्न पर्दा धर कि अब विभिन्न किसिम का रोग का अब आँच अब तस्त हो We thought um, we we hardly had three months of uh, preparation before the festival itself, and um, we started gearing up, trying to stop it. We knew that this was the largest of its kind of event, uh, and we knew that there would be many people, many animals uh, would be killed. Um, I was me and my friend Santos. We we're just two of us uh, animal uh, welfare people in the entire thing. When we reached the the town. Uh, and the, the, the site, it was night time. What I saw was, this was, if there was anything that you could see in Earth that resembled to the concept of hell, this was it. Um, basically human feces everywhere. You couldn't move, just, up, just to cover 100 meters distance, you would end up uh, spending at least an hour. Uh, literally, you have to push through the through the crowd. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't push through the crowd. You, you had to walk. You know, it was like the whole mass moving. Um, so human feces everywhere. All our trousers were covered in animal blood, uh, mud, and whatnot, dust, smog, because hundreds of thousands of people were making fire to keep themselves warm and their kids warm uh, in that uh, cold um, season. So eye-burning smog, uh, blaring loudspeakers, uh, mothers wailing, kids wailing, trying to find each other. Uh, many were lost, many died, many children died because of the cold and because of the stress and everything. So that was, uh, that, that's what it was um, to us. Um, everything about Godimai, everything that we observed about Godimai was wrong. Everything that is wrong with, with humanity, Godimai was uh, a representative of, 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 of that. Um, so in that kind of place where we went, uh, I mean, we laughed at our naivety um, because we're there to stop it. And how you're in the middle, you're like a drop in the ocean, in the middle of a crowd, not knowing which direction is where. Um, where do you start? Who do you fight? What do you fight against? It's just, you know, it, it's just lost. You don't know where to start. That's what, uh, that's what we felt. We're just a little flicker of light that uh, easily got extinguished. So we took that opportunity to know more about, about it and document it so we could tell it to a larger audience. Um, again, human sites. Uh, there's, there are many kinds of human when it comes to Godimai. Uh, the butchers, what happened in that arena, let alone all the other animals, goats, chicken, this, that, uh, pigs. We're, let's just focus on the, on the buffaloes. 18,600 buffaloes were killed in that arena. Uh, all hacked randomly to death. I didn't see any spirituality. I didn't see any religion. I didn't see any faith in there. It was fairly sports. How, much, how many can I kill? It was all about their ego, male ego or butcher's ego, whatever it is. People are just um, counting numbers. Uh, some didn't even bother to finish any animal off if they just ended up hacking. Some were big bulls, so they started by hacking their legs off first, so you know, it would be easier. Um, it was fairly sports. What I thought at the moment, I was theorizing constantly, trying to understand the whole phenomenon better, so we could be better prepared for uh, another time which would give us five years. So what I saw there was faith is difficult to uh, deal with, relatively, of course, but if it's just the sports, maybe, maybe there's a chance, maybe there's a hope. We're, we, we had to constantly uh, feed ourselves with some, some sort of uh, optimism and uh, not just die there after you know, seeing what we had seen. The other humans, um, <clears throat> the other humans are 
children, elderly people, destitutes, poor people, sick people, unemployed people, childless, seriously desperate from every single angle, pushed, cornered, tortured, exploited, optionless. And these are the people who bring the animals. These are the culprits. I didn't know who to, you know, like when I said who to fight, who to fight against. I didn't want to fight them. I didn't want to see them in, in, in the other side of the ring or, you know, other side in the, in the ring like we're fighting. Because um, I don't know, you know, we're talking about animal transportation guidelines uh, as an as, as a intervening tool to bring. Um, this, there were pregnant women, elderly people, who died during the transportation and in the festival uh, venue itself, who were transported probably in worse condition than, than the animals, because these, these animals are at least uh, treated especially because these are goddesses' animals, for that moment at least. So where's the, where's the distinction line that separates human suffering and animal suffering? It was something really uh, um, interesting um, for us to see and to realize. Um, and then we had to deal with other kind of humans uh, of our campaign. That was the global public, uh, public from Nepal or elsewhere, because uh, this was internationalized after, um, you know, after we came back. And uh, there was huge, huge, huge public outrage, dumping rage in Nepal, in uh, Hinduism as a religion, uh, the culture, barbarians, cruel people, you know, dimwits, uh, ancient you know, hunters and gatherers, I mean, what not, just every single uh, bad word, swear words, just you would see in, uh, in social media, generalized thoughts about, uh, about every single Nepalese. So highlighting the negativity. And uh, that became one of, the, one of the biggest challenges for us to deal, uh, deal with later. That's, uh, that's where I realized uh, something about you know, human behavior change, not as a concept, but you know, about what we're trying to do, change some behaviors there. That empathy, uh, lack of empathy was the biggest challenge. Um, so we tried to attack uh, Gaudimai from every single angle. Um, started from the heart of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Gaudimai village. We gathered 12,000 supporters, uh, and that didn't happen by calling them barbarians, of course. That happened by having that, showing that empathy, by trying to understand them better, who they are, why do they do what they do. Um, you know, they don't have NHS, they don't have any insurance, they don't have any government to bail them out when they're, they don't have uh, unemployment allowances or anything like that. Where do they go? Where do they, where do they find that final resort, last resort, for their, you know, to, to, to resort their hopes on, to rest their hopes on, is the, is the God in mind. And these people are illiterate people, easily manipulated, easily become victim of, uh, of uh, you know, fraudsters, like uh, organizer of the, of the festival. So, you know, you have to understand whether they are actually victim or the perpetrators. And sometimes uh, the gray area is bigger than the other two itself. So we tried to, you know, uh, corner this whole thing from every single angle. Uh, one big thing was understanding, uh, understanding ego this uh, activism versus slacktivism uh, became a big deal, uh, inflating egos. I had spent years and years uh, to force that relationship with the, with the people there, the villagers. Not only that, we realized that we have to work together with the main enemy, which was the temple committee back then. And we, we had succeeded. We never were uh, intervened by them. We're never, uh, you know, uh, our ways are never blocked when we ran all that uh, really aggressive, radical, um, programs in the, in the community um, by the by the temple committees. We had we were in you know we're tight in so many different ways because we we didn't we never used disrespectful ways. Uh, we always sought for their blessings. This is the chairman, uh, that's the, sec the uh, secretary, and uh, also the chief priest. So that's how we had done it. And then some friends came and he started threatening them, uh, told them they would kill them, they would kill their uh, sons and this and that. And that is what started causing trouble because I was the one. I was the main key person who would introduce them to other people, hoping that they get to understand this temple committee, get that kind of exposure how the rest of the world takes this. Uh, it's not a matter of uh, you know, uh, pride for them. It's, it's, there's a difference between infamity and popularity. But then the same kind of people started threatening them, and it was all pinned on me. And that caused a huge, huge loss. And that is one of the responsible factors why we couldn't shut it down in, in 2014, otherwise we're very close. 
uh, back then. So sometimes you have to understand that when you approach certain communities, do not do anything. Be very, very cautious uh, not, to in, uh, not to trigger that negative ego chord. Uh, otherwise, you're in, you, you know, you're in trouble. I don't want to make any controversial statements here. I'm not here to make any controversy. Uh, but just you know, by expressing my, my uh, honest opinion, this is exactly what I, what I see in Taizi uh, when it comes to you know, uh, dolphin protection and this and that. Not that I, you know, I want to demean uh, or undermine anyone's uh, work or efforts. I know there are some heroes uh, who are working on these issues. But the ego is just, you know, uh, Messed uh, beyond beyond recovery at this at this point. Same with uh, the dog meat thing in Korea, and especially whaling, because it wasn't even a thing until people started you know dumping their rays in Korea and their people in the country in general and their you know culture everything. People people don't want to be dominated. You know, if they can uh, revolt, then they do, and that revolting is becomes the biggest challenge later on. So you don't want to create that uh, that kind of mess for yourself if you want to uh, change uh, something for good. Basically. Another understanding, the biggest lesson is do not be judgmental. This man, I've seen um, firsthand ripping heart out of uh, a living animal. This very man who is the chief uh, temple priest of Godimai. And um, you have to understand that what they do, it's right for them. You know? So you, you just can't come and preach and you know, tell them they're wrong and things will uh, start uh, being fine. You have to shed that judgment to be able to make that first approach, positive approach. Um, and um, <clears throat> this is the man who set the price uh, in my head. I was wanted at, at one point, not that uh, long ago before 2014 festival. And this is the same man, every time I see him, I pull his hand, the same hands that rips hearts of animals apart, and I put it in my, in my forehead as a sign of uh, seeking blessing from him. That is how we worked. Um, uh, down to the ground. And we have to understand, uh, establishing motives of, of people, why they do what they do, Garimai was their identity. This village does not have anything else, anything else that these people can be proud of or boast of, other than poverty and you know, all, the, all, the, all the dark things. So this was the only thing that uh, they were known for. And now, because we internationalized it, uh, the whole world knows. So that spotlight, they didn't want to uh, leave that. And the other thing was nobody wants to be defeated. So if it comes to be like a tug of war, then they will pull as hard as they can from their side. So what we had to do uh, in, in, in their psyche was let them understand that this is slowly uh, going down anyways. So don't you want to be the victor when this whole thing comes out you know, through the, you know, uh, to the other side of the tunnel? You want to come out as a victor, not someone who, who got defeated. Because this, regardless of whether we do anything or not, this thing will die out in time. And why don't you want you know, to, to be uh, in the front line taking that credit and not giving that credit to any NGO or any slackivist or, or any activist like me? And that really worked uh, to a huge extent. And that brought every, uh, the whole system into, into a, a, a balance, basically. <clears throat> so in 2019, uh, in 2009, like I said, um, there were 18,600 buffaloes. Uh, that's the only animal we could count. And the ratio dynamics was a uh, little more than 60, uh, uh, little less than 60% from India and uh, more than 40% from Nepal. In uh, 2014, the, not only the number had declined to 3,256 buffaloes, but also the ratio had changed hugely, uh, despite of the fact that people think uh, it was the it was the Supreme Court of India's uh, ban in in uh, a border seal that stopped the animals from coming coming from India, uh, which did a massive massive help. But if you see the dynamics, uh, it's actually the ratio uh, within that number, within that hugely decreased number of 3,256 buffaloes, only 14 point something percent came from Nepal, and rest still came from India. So 12,000 supporters that I uh, talked about earlier, that pub public uh, sensitization, that community mobilization showed its result, because we were respectful again, because we tried to understand them. Um, so it's, you know, that, that kind of approach is uh, very important. Representatives not to hurt any animal during the next Karimai or any other festival held at the Karimai temple. Basto <laughs> 
की कोई छोटी मोटी बात नहीं है बहुत बड़ा चुनौती है बलि की परंपरा धीरे धीरे विश्व में अगर हट जाए तो ये बहुत सुंदर बात है आज हम ये कर रहे हैं क्योंकि इस बलि के प्रति जहाँ तक भी हो आप लोग भी उन लोगों में प्रचार प्रसार करें जो कि कल से बलि की जगह पर दूसरा चीज़ कोई बलि सके ये हंड्रेड परसेंट हम लोग उस बलि प्रथा को रोक सकते हैं और उसके अलावा वही नारियल का बलि हो परिक्रमा हो माता के समीप में डोला लेकर के हम लोग जाएँ मिष्टान चढ़ाएँ यदि माँ है तो सबकी माँ है हमारी भी माँ है और उस निर्मम पशु की भी माँ है थैंक यू वन थिंग वन वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट मैसेज वन वी प्राउडली सी दिस वीडियो I would like to highlight uh, the problem in here. I'd like to highlight the problem um, that I noticed in that thing. You saw Animal Welfare Network Nepal uh, and uh, Human Society International logo in the in the in the banner in the back. And Human Society International was very crucial in uh, leading all the Indian side of uh, things, and they were massively helpful. Um, and AWNN had been, you know, spearheading this campaign from the very beginning. But uh, when I said giving the credit, sometimes it's very important to be loyal to the cause and uh, be, be magnanimous enough to uh, give that credit to, to your target, to the subject people that you're working, uh, working with or working on to try, try and change their behavior. Uh, this caused a lot of uh, uh, jealousy and organizational rivalry as well because everybody, every single entity, every single organization wanted a piece of Gaudi for themselves because it was already established as a, as a, as a, as, as a global you know, highlight. Um, and what we should have done, because that particular press conference was supposed to be Gaudi Mai Temple Committee's press conference. And sometimes if we're not careful or thoughtful about those kind of things, then it can have some serious implications, which we did. And we draw a serious flack from the public, from other organizations, uh, I mean, I don't, care much about other organizations. At, that, at least I, I didn't at that point. Um, but also, uh, you know, it works in a different way uh, within the psyche of the Temple Committee people as well. Um, because it was about them, it's, it's not about us. So sometimes it, it, you have to have that magnanimity and, uh, and have a big heart to give all the credit to the, to the people because it's their de decision after all. If they did not want to be there, we couldn't, we couldn't have forced them. So it wasn't us, you know, I mean, despite of the fact that we, it's just I and, uh, AWNN worked days and nights to make that possible uh, in, in, in so many ways. And I've lost, uh, not lost, but invested you know, at least five years of my uh, life and rigorous five years of my life to make that happen. But it was the Temple Committee. And that is, I think, one of the key understandings uh, when we're talking about human behavior change. Model Donkey Conway, I'll, I'll just quickly run through these uh, things. This is uh, you know, a small uh, um, thing that I was involved with. Uh, there's a, a well-reputed organization in our country that, that deals with the brick kiln donkeys. And uh, they had already done this convoy thing for three times in the past. The fourth time because uh, these donkey owners used to get extorted by illegitimate um, uh, illegal uh, groups uh, in the way, um, way and back from Kathmandu. Um, so I was uh, invited by the, by the chief vet. Um, to be on board, so I could, you know, negotiate my ways and use my contacts with the police and, and political use a little bit of, uh, you know, political connections to ease the way. And that's uh, uh, something that they were doing, very much right in line of human behavior change and, you know, forging that good relationship with the target audience or, you know, target uh, subject humans um, by helping them out in other things as well, like livelihood and, you know, making things easier for them, so they have a positive <coughs> perception about you, so they listen to you. But one, one big message I got then was, <clears throat> regardless of the fact that we called it model convoy, there were pregnant uh, donkeys in there. Three of them, four of them at least, uh, died. Uh, there were lames, uh, open, you know, animals with, with open wound, which didn't fit to the concept of model donkey convoy. It didn't even fit with the concept of uh, Nepal government uh, animal transportation guideline standards, basically. So we were doing things, we wanted to do things set a uh, uh, standard, but we, we, we failed in maintaining that standard. And this is something that they didn't do, or we, this is something that we, we were not supporting. We, this, this model donkey convoy was ours. You know, we had a logo in the, in the first few trucks, 
Uh, there were 14 drugs altogether and uh, about 600 animals in there. And this was the first time because I was, you see this scene, this is the Vulture Village. You know, everything is connected. This is the Vulture Village and th th this was the, out of the four convoys, this was the first time the animals were uh, provided with a break of six hours. They, they got some water, they had, uh, you know, open field to graze in. For the first time, out of you know, all those, uh, and this was 54 hours uh, journey without any water. There's, there's no way, and 42 degrees, 43 degrees. So sometimes when you're trying to force that relationship, sometimes when we're trying to build that good positive relationship by giving something to them, you know, by offering something, by being friends to them, never ever compromise with your own ethos. I mean, that's kind of obvious, but you know, in, in certain contexts, it, it comes as a, as, as a real uh, lesson, actually. So, what we saw was, uh, you know, when, when you're trying to go that, do not uh, be uh, part of that, uh, that torture or suffering yourself because this is yours. It's a different thing. Sometimes you have to choose your battles and you stay quiet when you see something's being wrong in certain ways. You don't go and pinpoint like, hey, man, you're doing this wrong. But it's, it's whole another story when you are setting up that model, when you are leading something. Otherwise, what kind of message are, are we giving? You do it's wrong. We do it's fine. And that, uh, again, creates a negative perception about you. And it doesn't help the fact that there are so many people, media included, think that it, NGOs are all about dollars and you know, it's all about keeping their donors happy and photos and this and that. That's all they want. They don't really care about the real thing that they otherwise preach. And that is a very, very devastating uh, implication if, uh, if we go that way. Anyways, dogs. I'll, um, uh, so basically, Nepal is a place where dogs are worshipped, and at the same time, uh, thousands of dogs are called uh, poisoned, beaten to death, uh, shot as well at times. <clears throat> Three million dogs in Nepal, um, and as you could see, kids, uh, these, some of these dogs uh, killed used to be uh, community dogs, uh, limnality is the word. Um, Arnie uh, used yesterday. There are many dogs in that, that cracks in Nepal. Community dogs, we call them. Partial ownership. There are so many ways you could interpret uh, their existence or their being. And these are the dogs that kids have must, you know, m must have fed at some times or patted or played with. And they know uh, them by, by their names, but the authorities come and uh, kill them and they have to witness something like this, which is really disheartening. Um, uh, not that long of a history um, uh, of you know, cats and neuter and release uh, kind of practice in, in, in Nepal, uh, but 11 years, 12 years, solidly, and uh, we haven't seen any, any really, really tangible outcome uh, because it's all in, in the loop, it's all in the cycle, it's all random, spor sporadic uh, thing, you know, uh, not so uh, structured, which is caused because we don't, we, we, you know, we, we've been lacking in focusing on the human behavior change. There's no human, there wasn't human aspect much of it. I mean, some school programs or you know, some community talks, but uh, not real uh, community engagement. So what we were giving as a message was, oh, it's all right to be responsible dog owners. It's all right, you know, if your get, dog gets sick, dump them in the uh, in the in the street. Uh, if you don't spay uh, or uh, neuter your dogs, the litter, it's fine to dump the puppies uh, because we are there. We'll come and clear up. Uh, it's very important when we talk about human behavior change, we need to establish the behaviors, the particular behaviors that we want changed. Um, <clears throat> basically, this is where uh, the concept, uh, this idea came, Manu Mitra. Manu means uh, human, and Mitra is friend, so this is basically human's friend. This is the uh, project uh, title. This is a uh, project owned by Kathmandu Metropolitan City, supported by Human Society International, uh, implemented by Jane Goodall Institute Nepal. Um, so the model, this time we're taking a bottom-up approach. Uh, Animal Management Committee in Kathmandu Metropolitan City has 35 wards. Uh, every single ward will have uh, Animal Management Committee. We already have them in a uh, few pilot, uh, pilot wards. So who is Animal Management Committee? Uh, it is for the legitimacy of it, for the authority uh, uh, of, the, of the committee. We have the, the village secretary as the, as the coordinator. But other people are village leaders who are already respected, who, who command respect in the, in the communities and who people listen to. Um, uh, our, our model in, involves a lot of uh, public forums and focus group discussions. So if you talk about focus group discussions, this was really interesting uh, because we were already doing um, uh, CAP survey. 
uh, thanks to Eli Hibi again. Uh, everything goes back to Eli. Um, um, the CAP survey was, is, is really important for monitoring and evaluation so that we, we can measure the change that we have been able to uh, introduce uh, with our work or intervention. Uh, but, uh, but the focus group discussion was really, really important and interesting because uh, many things came out from the, uh, from the participants themselves, from the uh, community members, which is, again, very key for uh, you know, understanding uh, the behaviors, attitudes, uh, knowledge, and perception. So basically, we found out through our uh, uh, focus group discussions that everybody wanted community dogs. This is not something uh, that occurs to you know, everybody's mind. Usually dogs are nuisance, they create in the litter, they create, uh, you know, they bite, they bark, you know, don't let people sleep, especially with the kids, and uh, cause accidents, traffic police, you know, other kind of nuisance, they lie dead, rotting, uh, you know, headache for the, for the municipality as well and for the people. Um, sometimes attacks, attack lively, you know, livestock and other animals. So basically they were problems, but we found almost everybody wanted community dogs. Many of them were actually genuinely concerned that with the sterilizing uh, the spay neuter program, these dogs might actually uh, go extinct, and they didn't want that. And some were like really, really vocal and aggressive about the fact that, you know, that's, that, that's what they thought we were uh, about to do. So we involved people like temple priests, uh, street cleaners, sweepers, uh, again, uh, mobilized by the Kathmandu Metropolitan uh, City, who would give us information about how some people want uh, these sweepers to take their dogs away, their, their sick dogs away, and dump them in, in, in some dumping uh, site or something like that. Uh, meat sailors, meat sailors, we had a separate focus group discussion with meat sailors and butchers, and uh, they are the ones who keep aside their best cut for the community dogs. So that kind of love already exists, uh, and dog owners were seriously against sterilization. You know, all these things we used for our mass communication because we got to know them better. We, we got to know what, what kind of knowledge level they are in, uh, what is the attitude and perception. Uh, we could better design our, uh, you know, educational materials and mass communication materials uh, that uh, could be made more efficient that way. Basically, animal management assistance. Every single ward you go, you'll find people who are feeding dogs, taking care of dogs this way or that way. Um, so the, the animal management committee of ward identifies these kind of people and recruits them. Uh, so we have a robust community engagement system uh, which goes beyond uh, animal management assistance as well because they will identify other people and they will engage other people. Um, community and school education, of course. We, we did a focus group discussion with teachers as well and students as well. Uh, so there are some curriculum changes that we're uh, prompting now uh, and uh, which is being taken very positively. Um, mass dog vaccination. Uh, Unlike other you know, interventions that we, we had uh, previously seen in Nepal, we, we don't want to focus much in mass dog vaccination and mass dog sterilization. Uh, even though it's crucial, you know, because uh, rabies is, is, is a big factor, big concern, and that also you know, gives us a lot of uh, weightage. But uh, we want these people to be responsible enough to do that themselves. We don't want to come as expert dealing with the technical side of things, you know, making ourselves look razzle-dazzle and, and you know, uh, be the gods basically. So the, this whole idea is about how to make them responsible so they do it. And we have seen some massive change in that. And later on comes dog registration and identification uh, that we're working on, on. And also we recently had a workshop with the uh, Animal Management Committee where they came up with few uh, practical clauses of, uh, of uh, some soft laws that they could uh, you know, bring in their, in their ward to test to also introduce the, the public uh, with the idea that it's fine, you know, it, we need these kind of things uh, before actually a law from the municipal level comes. Um, so basically, <clears throat> we have, so now we have best team for dog catching, they're trained, but they, they don't need to, to do that because as soon as our van goes there, you will see community people lining up with their dogs. And these are community dogs, not privately owned dogs. They will go out and, you know, catch these dogs and uh, they're very much willing to support. So our dog catching team or anim animal welfare officers uh, can engage in better educating and talk to them, you know, if there are any issues or any queries or anything like that. So their time is spent more productively. Um, and this is also a model, not only focusing on the dogs, because the model is already there, the apparatus, the, the device, the mechanism is already there. So that is why we call it animal management uh, committee. So there might be some stray cattle issues or this or that, uh, you know, that can be addressed by the same uh, 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 committee, basically. Um, so everything that I discussed about, I took extra time, and I'm really, really guilty of that. So this, <laughs> I, I will uh, 
you know, this is the last slide. So everything that we discussed uh, earlier talks about what different tools, what different approaches do we need to take to make sure that we make the right, uh, right approach, uh, you know, right thing at the right time, how not to mess things, how to maximize the, the productivity of the uh, you know, intervention or, or you know, that kind of thing or efficiency. Um, but the foundation of human behavior change for me is the emotion. Without emotion, no matter how much of information you load, we've already talked about this, I mean, I'm, I'm only repeating, but particularly on this dog thing, there was, there was so much of mass communication things that we brought uh, and uh, in, in, the, in the workshops and things like that, people would sleep. And of course, they have kids and this and that, and you know, everybody's life has you know, their own stories. But <laughs> as soon as you bring in a really hard, emotionally hard-hitting material in the screen and show, it, show a three-minute video about the human-dog relationship, that's like really, really hard-hitting emotionally, then you, you can run the workshop for the rest of the day, and you will get their interest. What, what makes that happen? You, you bring that emotional vulnerability side of thing that is universally common among all humans. I mean, we have our thresholds uh, of what intensity of emotional hitting uh, breaks you down or makes you, you know, gives you that clog in the throat or eyes, you know, uh, tears in the eyes or something like that. But we all have that vulnerability. And I think that vulnerability, as negative as it might sound, is the greatest resource. And we have to do every possible thing to exploit that to its maximum limit uh, so we can make the best use of the materials, the information, the, uh, you know, the education thing. Because unless they are you know, emotionally open, emotionally vulnerable to that state about that particular matter, the, the thing will just you know, rebound or just you know, go tangentially. So to open that vessel, uh, emotion is the, is, the, is the key. So basically, emotion is the uh, moist compost, uh, whereas information is the dry seed. And, from you know, my uh, view, the, the sapling, the growing sapling would be human behavior change. Thank you so much and sorry so much. I'm really, really sorry.